things. And now I'm up here with Shell and um, looking for uh, to see what kind of uh, exciting things that you guys will be asking. All right, very good. And uh, I am appreciative that he said yes. Uh, so we have three elders, and so uh, the other ones are on notice. And uh, so he became the guinea pig, too, for the... For the uh, that's not nice to put it that way, is it? No, I love to be a pig. <laughs> Sorry. All right. All right. Well, do we have any questions? I'm going to look up. Let's, let's start with one. And we'll kind of bounce back and forth. We may both comment on a question. Um, but, uh, yeah. First one says this, I have heard and read from pastors and authors, but is it biblical to make a statement such as we have to forgive ourselves? We have to forgive ourselves. That's a really, there's a lot of layers in that simple question, isn't there? We have to forgive, I'll lead off in this and then David can fix whatever I say. Uh, (laughs) I would say there's two things going on here. There, I think there's, from a spiritual standpoint and what we believe about forgiveness ultimately rooted in God's grace, there's a sense in which we forgive ourselves, but we have to receive God's grace, right, in order for that to happen. We have to walk in his grace in order to walk in, in freedom from sin or past mistakes, sins. And in that sense that I would say, yeah, we, we do have to learn that. But for us, when you're following Christ, there's a power within you that you're working with. It's not just a will to... I got to release that in my own strength, but rather, Lord, I've confessed this before you, and if someone else was involved, that it was appropriate to have that conversation. Sometimes it's not, depending on the power dynamic, but most times it is, uh, that I've had that conversation, and then the enemy works with guilt and condemnation to keep us bound, right? The enemy keeps, you know, I've heard it said before that when it's the Lord, it's conviction, and he also provides a way out through forgiveness reconciliation where possible, uh, releasing it to the Lord and receiving his mercy. And sometimes we have to reappropriate that. I think John says we come boldly before his throne of grace in our time of need that we might receive mercy. Uh, And so we have that access to God. Uh, The pastors are not mediators. The elders are not mediators. We can receive that uh, in that sense. So I think it depends what you mean by that. If you're trying to forgive yourself and your own willpower and you're playing a psychological game. Some of that's important, I think, in terms of health and function, but we have to go deeper and say, is there a spiritual thing that I need to seek where there's clarity uh, with the Lord with that? And and I I think that's okay. Um, You just got to ask, what do you mean when you say that? Okay, do you have anything you want to fix that with or comes to mind? I think you said it really well. And, um, you know, we always have to ask God, forgiveness, First, but um, we've heard many, many stories that people can go years and years that they cannot forgive themselves, and they they cannot they can never get out of that hole. And I think once when you have asked God for the forgiveness, I am pretty sure uh, you're freely. To forgive yourself, and if you can't do that, um, I think you always be in that rut, and uh, not being able to release yourself from, you know, whatever sin that was committed, um, would not help you in your walk with God. And I think that's uh, yeah. that's um, what I my, my my take on that would be. And do you think it would be fair to say, too, that if someone's really wrestling, like they're, they're really just keep wrestling with that condemnation guilt, that that might be a time for more spiritual direction or counseling to really wrestle with why is it that are there are other issues that haven't been brought out. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. The next question. Please explain what you mean when you say we live in a post-Christendom world. You want to take that one? I know you've been wrestling with this in one of your classes, right? Yeah, we uh, we actually did that at a home group what, about two weeks ago, was that right? And um, I showed them a video uh, from um, uh, Tim Keller, uh, John Piper, and um, what's the last guy? Um, that New Testament scholar. They're not my favorites. D.A. Carson. <laughs> <laughs> D.A. Carson. And in that video... Um, uh it it really depends on what 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 you meant by uh we, we, first of all we brought out 
Christian prosecution, like you know, uh, in terms of like you know, uh, we are being persecuted, and 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 one of Carol's comment was, um, we haven't really seen that kind of like total onslaught yet, like the things that you have seen, like from the Muslim countries. Uh, from China, where is like you know you can publicly ban Christians from saying or doing anything. So we we can't say that outright that at least in 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 North America or in Europe that we are under total persecution. Um, so that's he what he would describe as a winter. He actually made it into four seasons: spring, summer, fall, and winter. And how he described post-Christendom is actually the fall. Uh, spring would be like you know the um, the uh, the you know the the spread of the gospel, the good news, and many people come to Christ. Summer it would be like the the church in full fledged. I would say that would be when you say that would be the U.S. Maybe in the 30s to 50s. Yeah, something like that. And then fall would be um, people really doubting Christianity, doubting the way that, um, you know, is there uh, a truth to 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 you know to Christ Himself? Like you know, like like nowadays we even have um, 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 biblical scholars like asking fundamental questions about whether you know Christ is a real person so that's how we would describe post christendom even like you know the the questions could be coming from uh, you know uh, long 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 like that 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 people has 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 been christians for a long time yeah, so I don't know if you have anything to add. You probably know a lot more than I do. Uh, hey, we, we are, we're bringing all of our knowledge to the table here. Um, I, yeah, I would agree with most of that. I would also say another way to think of it, too, is this idea of Christendom was the, you know, that, that Christianity was permeated in a culture, very much what you just shared, um, and that it so permeated the culture that people knew the stories of the Bible, even if they were not, didn't necessarily believe them, but they knew them. Um, they knew what the churches, what churches did, uh, the compassion work, the message, all that. Um, and a post-Christendom to me is that that's no longer a given. That given is no longer there, that most people in a culture no longer would even know the stories of the Bible through culture just by living in a culture or living in a country. And that's changed in the U.S. and Canada in that sense that uh, I suspect that the average person on the street, if we just went and picked 10 people randomly in our neighborhood and said, hey, do you know the story about Enoch? They, you know, they wouldn't, you know, and that's, okay, that's, that's post-Christendom. Whereas maybe 50 years ago when you did that and you pulled 10 people, you'd get five of them. They're like, oh yeah, I know Enoch and I can tell you about Methuselah too. And, uh, and so that sort of latent cultural Christianity I come from an Anabaptist background, and so for me, I tend to look at post-Christendom as a really good thing, because when you have enough Christianity in a culture, it just inoculates people from actually obeying Jesus and following his teachings, uh, and so we still had governments, and the U.S. is a great example. A lot of people knew the Bible stories, but if you ask about the golden days of Christianity in America, well, if you were African-American 50 years ago in the United States, I wouldn't say it was a golden day of Christianity at all, uh, and so Christendom actually caused a lot of sort of uh, sins to be overlooked and said, oh, yes, yes, we know the story, but in terms of are you actually wrestling with what it means in this culture here and now, I don't think you could say that. Uh, and so that's uh, so we're in a post-Christendom world, I would say, in North America. Um, we're not in winter, for sure. Thank the Lord for that. Yeah. Um, but the church has an opportunity to help people discover Jesus again without some of those entrapping cultural pieces of whatever old America or old Canada was, um, because there were certainly good things about that, but there was also a big dark side to that about inoculating people from truly following Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. So that's a great question. You got it great. You got all kinds of wisdom. Don't don't sell yourself short. That was great. Uh, there's a reason why he's an elder, by the way. He's he's being humble, I think, which is good, right? Uh, 
Okay, I've been a Christian for many years, read my Bible, pray, and have devotions. What can I do to make my devotional life and walk with the Lord be more vibrant? More vibrant. Hmm. You think about that for a moment. I've been a Christian for many years, read my Bible, pray, and devotions. Yeah, I think it, throughout our Christian life, there are stages. And sometimes people say, well, you just need to go back to you know, the Sunday School 101 lessons. Occasionally, you may need to do that. But a lot of times, you can't go back because you've grown. Your relationship with the Lord and with your, the people around you has changed as time goes. And you're not the same person you were 10 years ago, hopefully, or 20 years ago. Maybe a few key things. Like, but it, ideally, discipleship is about growing in love. And I would say my question to that would be, how are you doing with community? If you know the stuff and you're rooted and grounded in that, how are you turning outward and serving others? Uh, If you want your faith to be more vibrant, I would say go deeper in a home group. Start engaging with your neighbors in your neighborhood. Find ways to do that. And as you turn outward, you'll experience the life of the Holy Spirit on the edges of God's kingdom. And that's where you're going to experience vibrancy. Um, it's, people, it's been said one way that the church is not supposed to be a museum uh, for dead people or dead tradition. It's supposed to be a birthing ward of a hospital. And um, so my question is, are, what are you, how are you participating in the birthing process for people to consider Jesus? And I think that might help you experience more vibrancy is getting out and figuring that out. And as a church, we're wrestling with how do we do that better in our small groups and our Sunday morning gatherings um, to be experience that vibrancy. But those are some things that first come to mind. I'm, I'm, do you got any other ideas about vibrancy and your devotion more than just the devotional life? I mean, that's important, solid stuff. Different prayer practices. Try different prayer practices as well. Um, be open to uh, healthy, con, you know, contemplative prayer. Be open to the gifts of the Spirit. Be open to um, trying liturgical prayers. Free, I mean, I think there's ways within those things too that you can. A push on that might you might find more life giving at a different stage in your spiritual journey with Jesus. Um, I noticed that question. He says, "Read my Bible, pray, and have devotions." And it says, like, a phrase like you know you're very much like reading on your own time, praying on your own time, have devotions in your own time. And like Shell says, uh, probably, you know, if, uh, if, if we go to a home group or, you know, be, just be more open about your faith and share it, uh, I'm sure that um, there'll be a lot of questions and challenges that would actually make the, your Christian life pretty vibrant like i mean i it was it was funny like you know uh years ago like they have this uh you know read the bible in a year thing and then you know you go through this bible you try to read it in a year you know with the prescribed chapter or whatever i did that for a few years but uh nowadays i go topical and a lot of times um uh you know when you actually read the bible and um um, you actually think about it and not adhering to that schedule, but on your own time, you actually would get a lot more out of it. I was in a, in a John Piper session, I think two years ago, at the center. I think that was the Westside Church. And, uh, you know, he, he goes to his Bible and then, you know, he was on a projector like this. And then he would highlight, read my Bible, he would also highlight pray, and he would have a yellow highlight on devotions. And then he can actually preach a sermon pretty much on the things that he highlighted. And everything that you've read, not according to a schedule, those words would come alive. And I would encourage, like, you know, I go through a lot of um, sessions in uh, region college and other things, and some of the things may not be the topics that you like to hear, but it opens up, you know, your faith, and you're actually uh, testing your faith outside of a church building, and what you're willing to hear, and that makes your faith vibrant, I think. Oh, David can lead off with this one. Uh, Is speaking in tongues real? If yes, how do we know that? 
All right, next question. Um, <laughs> let's talk about gay marriage and politics next. Let's get the easy stuff first. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll answer that. I was raised in Pentecostalism, so I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, I believe it's real, and I believe there are people that fake it. There you go. Next question. Um, yes, I mean, it's a spiritual gift listed in several places in the Bible, and so if we're going to take the scripture at its face value, uh, then we need to affirm that. There are some people who are called cessationists that believe that none of those word gifts are really active today. They sort of have wiggle room, though, because they don't agree on which gifts have ceased. Uh, so there's sort of a messiness there. Um, but you'll find globally, you know, in North America and Europe and some churches have been established, you know, there it had been a hotter debate than it's globally. Like you'll go into Baptists, Pentecostals, Catholic, Orthodox, whoever in the global South, and this question doesn't usually come up because they just assume, well, it's in Scripture and we've experienced it, and so let's move on and not make it a controversy. Let's welcome it, not make it a controversy. But in North America, mind you, particularly, there have been churches that have split over this issue, um, and there's varieties of what do you do with that gift. But Paul talks about that to the church at Corinth in, in again, chapters uh, 12, 13, and 14. He talks about, here's a church that was valuing speaking in tongues. They came from a pagan culture where there was also a pagan version of that. And so there's a redeemed version of it now uh, that God uh, says there's a different way of this. And he says, but here's, it needs to happen in this order. And it doesn't mean you're more spiritual than someone else because they thought, well, if we spoke in tongues, we're better than others in our church who didn't. And Paul puts a tamper down on that and says, no, no. He said, you know, I wish that all of you spoke in tongues, he says to this letter, letter to the Corinthians. And then he says, but I would rather that you all prophesy. Like if you're going to fixate on one of the spiritual gifts, and there's multiple Holy Spirit-inspired gifts, he says, do this one first, and that's the one you want to use in the gathering of the church, because it's in, when you do that, you're speaking in the language of your hearers, or the languages of your hearers. But then he goes on and affirms tongues. He says, on the other hand, this is a gift that builds up the inner man. It builds up the inside of you, uh, that it enables something where you commune with God that kind of goes beyond your normal way of thinking, your normal cognitive process, that there's something that happens in that I call it play of the Holy Spirit that God empowers you directly, regardless of your education level, regardless of where you're at in your spiritual journey. It's a gift that allows a building and strengthening up. So for me, my default has always been, why would I not want all of the gifts? Why would my default position be, Lord, you can use me in the gift of admin, but you cannot use me in the gift of healing. Lord, you can use me in the gift of uh, leadership, but you cannot use me in the gift of um, generosity. Lord, you can use me in the gift of... I, to me, that's a immature spiritual place. I don't ever want to be. I said, Lord, I want all of the gifts you have for me, even if it makes me uncomfortable, because there are things, there are certain gifts in New Testament that go beyond the things in the natural. In fact, you won't stumble across speaking in tongues. You won't stumble across uh, uh, words of wisdom or divine inspired words of the spirit. You actually have to be open to that. And that's why Paul says to the Corinthians, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, pursue these things. Don't be ignorant of them. Um, because our, can, our, our default is to go to the lowest common denominator, throw the baby out with the bathwater if we have a bad experience, and then miss something that may change someone's life forever. And I don't want to be in that position. So if you want to add, you can. I don't, I'll, I'll let you off the hook otherwise. So, <laughs> no, you're okay with that. All right, well, then he gets to lead off on the next one. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> They're getting harder. Are we supposed to read out the question? Oh, yeah, read it out loud. Yeah, because you're supposed to read oh, it. I swear. <laughs> How do you get excited about reading scripture? It, it, it is hard. Like, I remember, what was it? Uh, Pastor Lon, you preach on that, um, one of those books that was, uh, we would dread, was it last year, the year before? Leviticus? Leviticus? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than numbers. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, if you have to come and make yourself... Uh, I remember um, when we were going through Leviticus, and that was a real exciting book. And, <laughs> and, and we, I have to lead that class in the back. Um, again, I have to go back to that Piper session that I went to. And there is a lot of things hidden in those 
some of those verses that you know in our previous life that we thought that you know none of those uh, ceremonies or those sacrifices make any sense in today's world. I mean, you know the the procedure about killing a ram. How do you clean? You know, cleanse yourself. Uh, why is it um, you know uh, relevant to us today? Um, but there are hidden messages in there, and if we brush it off as something that um, that is boring, and you would like to skip, you know, maybe back to Matthew. Uh, part of God's word is missing, and and I think the challenges in that, in a way, it's almost like we go through life ourselves and um, you know there are always highs and lows in the lives that we're living and we always like to forget the part that um, you know that's a low part of our life but quite often it's in that low part of of our lives that uh, lessons could be learned and if you just keep on saying you know I don't like to be you know in this low point of my life for very long, um, I don't think we can actually grow out of that. And the same thing with scriptures. And, uh, you know, exciting, you know, the the, the part is actually missing about uh, how do you get excited about reading the part that you don't want to read in scripture? (laughs) I think that's a more appropriate question. I'm pretty sure you have something to add to this. Oh, yes, that's that's, that's great stuff. Uh, Really good. I... I kept thinking like there's parts of scripture that to me are candy and there's parts of it that are like, this is Brussels sprouts or this is asparagus. And for those of you that love Brussels sprouts, God bless you. Um, yeah, yeah. There's, oh yeah. In my family, it's definitely, there's, you can get a good discussion about Brussels sprouts. Um, and so there's some pieces that really will speak to you depending on where you're at in life, where you're at in your spiritual journey, where you're at with Jesus, where you're at with all of it. Um, and so I think part of that excited about I think there's some things that are go-to verses for me when I, hey, I need encouragement and I go there. But then there's other in my normal reading pattern of scripture that I have to push through the wall. I have to push through the wall of resistance. But I always, when I actually push through that wall, God still speaks. And I think there's something of the enemy in spiritual warfare when we come to the Bible uh, that there always is a wall of resistance. And we see that in the natural world, like when we're learning a new skill set, if you're learning a sport or you're learning a new instrument, there's a wall that you have to push through in practice. And then you experience the rewards and the joy once you push through it. I think today our technology, and there's more and more research that says it's, it's, it's keeping us from learning like deep reading of anything, the deep reading, deep going deep into anything because our technology is sort of numbing us and I'm worried about uh, my kids' generation and the next generation in this that we might lose essential imagination and human skills uh, through the convenience of our technology is also killing something in us and so I think that also happens in our spiritual life. That's why the gathered community, I'm all for internet church as we were getting ready this morning. A bunch of French churches are live streaming and all of that and of course we're not there yet at this place um, and I thought, well, at the same time, this gathered community, even in the sort of, you know, it's more superficial on Sunday morning in some ways, better worship and teaching, but we go deeper than in a home church. But those gathered community, we lose something if we don't do this. I mean, I understand some people can't, but there's something that happens when you get in the messiness of social skills and how do I communicate with someone who's, and the church is such a beautiful new neighborhood in that we also tear down all kinds of barriers by putting Jesus at our center instead of other things. Um, we missed something there. So scripture, yeah, I just went off. I normally, say, this is new. It's already in the back. They have to hand the, okay, do prophets exist today? Hmm. I'm going to answer yes. <laughs> I, I you may would, not agree, by the way. I, I would say so, but, I mean, we always, uh, <laughs> you know, have second doubts about, you know, you know who the true prophets are, and there's so just so many, and uh, yeah. and the media doesn't help. No, if they're on Christian TV, probably not. Uh, if they're in the church and someone comes up to you and says, "Hey, I've been praying," 
And it is since the Lord has said that I need to share this to you. By the way, all of you, Paul says, I want all of you to do that. Moses said he wanted all the children of Israel to be open to prophetic speech. I would take that as chances of being way more real than the TV person up there. Um, And then Paul gives instructions for testing prophecies in the New Testament sense of it. You test it. You just don't take it as a sheer word from God. Holy Spirit gets blamed for all kinds of garbage. I mean, I can tell you uh, stories. I'll, I'll resist that urge right now. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, like, the Holy Spirit gets blamed for a lot of things, but in, in the New Testament, the, the gifts of the Spirit, including prophetic words, Paul says this is a gift of the church. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. These are gifts, and, and how they're going to be operated, oh, is in humility. And, and it says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets, and you test it. If someone says, I have a word from the Lord, and that they're going beyond Scripture, but in, applying it in a unique way, in a unique time, you don't just take that. There's dirt and divinity involved. We're the earthen vessels. He's the divinity. So you always say, I mean, I, but I, you need to test this. You need to try this. Discern this with someone. The, and especially if it's some major, major thing, you want to you discern that. If it's going to impact other people, you must discern those words. You don't just take them as straight as the oracles of God. You know That's not how it works in terms of New Testament prophecy. In Hebrew Bible, the prophets, it was told that if it's a, found to be a false prophet speaking the name of God, you're supposed to kill him. Uh, thank the Lord that was not the end of the revelation and came in Jesus, you know. But um, the New Testament is more concerned about the prophecies given uh, than necessarily calling someone a prophet, per se. I, I, there's more we can say about that, but we better go to the next. Do we have a few more? Okay, are, are you guys doing okay? We can go a few more minutes, but we're not going to, you know, normally we teach 30 to 40 minutes, so we want to aim for that window. Are you, I need some nodding or thumbs down or something. Okay, we'll do a few more, and then uh, when David calls it, when he walks <laughs> off the stage, it's over. What's unbiblical about the prosperity gospel? Should Christians reject the prosperity gospel? That's more like a U.S. question. <laughs> 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 there was a mega church in Toronto that, that got investigated for uh, prosperity gospel stuff, so it's not just U.S. I know, but uh, no, you don't get off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that Will Smith movie. I don't know if you've uh, seen it. I don't know. What's it called? Pursuit yeah, Pursuit of Happiness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's the, the, na- the title of the movie is called Pursuit of Happiness. So appropriately, prosperity gospel, is it the pursuit of happiness? And is it biblical or unbiblical if you're just pursuing happiness? And what's prosperity? Yeah. Like, you know, is it just money? All the, you know, monetary. And, you know, um, I guess... If you put prosperity equal to wealth, then the statement will be true. That is unbiblical. If you put the word, you highlight the word. I'm going back to um, Piper again. You highlight prosperity and you put an equal mark, wealth, on the other side. Then... You can also highlight unbiblical. Yes, that is true. But if you highlight prosperity, and on the other side of that equal mark, you put down happiness, blessing your neighbor, love, and all the good things that uh, that's in Galatians that was written, um, that's biblical. So it depends on how you highlight that word prosperity. Yeah, I agree. That's good stuff. Um, another thing that comes to mind, too, is it kind of depends where you're standing, right? Um, the, I remember reading Amos Young, uh, a Pentecostal theologian, and he talked about in the majority world um, that there's this aspect of prosperity gospel where he, w- he would affirm, I think he would affirm everything like David said, but also he would say there is a role for saying there's something about Jesus that changes, that brings uplift in people's life, and that, of course, also impacts their material. 
Um, now, most of us, I, I would imagine here, are not struggling with uh, having our next meal or clean water. Uh, most of us in this room, I am, I'm assuming, again, I'm new here, uh, probably it, you have clothes, you have the ability to get clothes one way or the other. Um, some real basic things, um, sanitation, your toilet flushes, you know. Well, if it doesn't, that's a different problem. But it, you have, you know, so in terms of some real basic human baseline stuff, and his argument was that there is a role for a type of prosperity gospel, a checked prosperity gospel, if it will, in saying that the kingdom message should make a difference in how we use our resources and make a difference in the world. And if we have, and if we've been blessed with resources, it is part of our call then to help figure out how do we help others enter into that in a way that humanizes them, raises them up, isn't, isn't dehumanizing, isn't like, you know, that kind of thing, but in a way that helps bring uplift to people. And so in that sense, it was very interesting. It wasn't a book, but it was an article that he wrote. If you Google Prosperity Gospel and Amos Young, you should be able to find it. But it was some years ago I read this, and it really helped me kind of say, okay, I can see pieces of truth in it. And then the Word of Faith movement, like we see on TV, that's just crazy town, right? Like, we're going to take another offering. We're going to, you know, the pastor needs to be a jet. I need a jet because I would like to fly from Hawaii to Vancouver, you know, to do my sermons. Uh, you know, I mean, stuff like that. What a waste, right? I mean, how can, and yet you see that in some, in the U.S., probably not in Canada, right? The CRA would be all over that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I, that's, there's a lot of layers in there. That's a great question. I, we could spend a whole session on that. Let's do another one, all right? We got one? Should patriotism have a place in the church? You're asking the American pastor this question. <laughs> who has an Anabaptist background. Uh, so my background, again, I mean, or how I think theologically is within sort of Pentecostal and Anabaptism, which overlaps with Baptists. Uh, in fact, Baptists and Anabaptists related in the Reformation. Um, Anabaptists said that it, really any church that's is subservient to the state is not a real church. It's a co-opted church. It's a Christendom church. Uh, and so for me, it, the, again, underlining and highlighting patriotism, what do you mean? Uh, for me, if patriotism means that we blindly follow the queen, I'm, just, as we all, I'm sure all of you have a picture of her in your, in your car and in your uh, house, right? <laughs> I haven't done enough home visits yet. I haven't seen the queen prominently displayed in most of your homes um, or apartments or wherever you are. Um, Blindly following uh, Trudeau or blindly following whoever or blindly following Donald Trump or Barack Obama or, uh, or giving affirmation, whatever the state does. In Romans 13, Paul says that the state has a role of restraining evildoers. And so there's a sense that we, we honor that and say, yes, we can respect that. When Remembrance Day is coming up. Um, I think we can honor the impulse to serve. But I personally would wrestle with when the state wields the sword um, should Christians participate in that? I think every believer needs to, if you're serious about Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, you've got to actually, and, and Paul restates this, and Peter restates this, and James restates this, and the early church for the first three centuries restated this pretty strongly until uh, Augustine came in and sort of uh, brought in some more Greek Hellenistic philosophy into the faith than was there. Um, so I think you really need to wrestle with that. What does that mean for me? Do I participate in the sword wielding of the state? If my ending of someone's life, and, and as Baptist evangelical Christians, if you end someone's life, generally we believe uh, if we don't know where they're at with Jesus, we may be helping hasten their demise eternally. Should I be participating in that? That's a really important question that every believer has to wrestle with. Um, I think it would be important to ask people in places, uh, you know, like China right now, where, is, what's... Z Z, did I'm yeah, saying his name right? Z. Yeah, he's bringing he's you know bringing Mao back in spades. I mean, he's cracking down on Christians, and he's you know he wants a church that he can control and he can sort of as long as it helps advance the the purposes there. Now we won't post this online. I don't want anyone to get in trouble. But I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I mean that's a question Chinese believers are wrestling with. How do we? Where do we stand in that? We want to, Romans 13, God has worked through the state, 1 John 5, 19, but the state ultimately is under the control of the evil one, and we live in that tension. How do we be good citizens and yet know when do we say, okay, you know, Paul said be good citizens. On the other hand, he also was breaking laws all the time in the name of spreading the gospel, so we have to live in that tension. Well, you got to fix that one because I just went on a tear. I don't know what you, yeah, you're good all luck. Yeah, all over the place. <laughs> I think it can go back to that story when Jesus flips the coin. Yeah. 
Yeah, pay your taxes. Worship to, the Lord. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, it, it's the time and the place. Uh, have a place in church? I don't know. It's, uh, again, you know, it depends on the circumstances. That's, that's a very, very why question, and you have to flip that coin. You know, if, if the uh, province of BC said we need to have a flag in our worship space and we need to have a picture of who's the premier? I don't know. I'm, I'm new. Whoever the person is. Uh, and we need to put them right up there on the, you know, in where a church would normally have a platform or believer's church. We don't call this altar, but, you know, we're a communion table or whatever. I would, prot- I would violate that law gladly and say, no, no, Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not. Um, uh, on the other hand, if they said, hey, church, will you help us engage in compassion initiatives in your neighborhood? Absolutely. Uh, or we'll help you. We'll, we'll provide resources to do this if you're willing to do Boy, I can work with the state on that. But when, it's, when it interferes with my ultimate loyalty, it's first to Jesus. My first allegiance is to Jesus. It's not to Trump. It's not to Trudeau. Isn't that neat? They both start with a T. Look at that. Unity. Um, it's to Jesus. And if push came to shove, I mean, I come from a Mennonite background family on one side. We, we literally were bloodily persecuted uh, because we wouldn't serve in the Prussian king's army because we believe that Jesus said you don't kill uh, we, we took that literally, my family took it, so we, we left. We were persecuted, we were killed. We, we went to another place that, was, that said, hey, come farm, do that. Eventually that changed and they left. So for me, I have a history in my family of personally literally leaving continents or bloodily being persecuted out of continents to not bow to Caesar when it means killing someone else. And so, yeah, that's a good... It's, so in the church, you know, we have to agree to disagree on some things too, but wrestle with it. How do we navigate our relationships with loved ones who have turned away from the Lord without feeling a constant need to reconvince them of the truth of the gospel? Yeah, yeah. You know, if you had a strong belief in something that you no longer have a strong belief in now, and someone tries to reconvince you of that, how do you feel when you have that conversation, right? You generally want to get out of it as fast as you can, you know, throw it into reverse and get out of that alley, right? Um, I think the key is, is that you are praying for them. You are living your faith in a real way. It can't just be words, or if it's words, it needs to also include the, I repent of this, I'm sorry for this as well. But I think praying for them, demonstrating Jesus to them, um, finding gentle ways when they are open to have the conversation, particularly if they've rejected the faith, right? They, They once affirmed it and now they've turned away. We know this, if you've read through the New Testament, there's some pretty hard words where that person is at in their heart as Paul's writing to a larger church, particularly about leaders who have rejected the gospel. But um, I think we just have to, we have to operate in love and prayer. And also, you know, don't shun, don't alienate, don't hold that person to the standard of the kingdom. You know, if someone's in the leadership position in the church, there are lists in Timothy and Titus. If someone is new to Christianity or wrestling with it or not in that, we don't hold everyone to the same standard of morality and that as well. And so I think, you know, you treat someone who has chosen to not follow Jesus differently in terms of how you're speaking into their life about stuff. It's not my job to be their Holy Spirit. It's not my job to tell them, I really dislike that you have, you know, uh, have three girlfriends. I find that trouble. I mean, I, I may speak that to them if I have a close relationship just on a shared morality basis, but I'm not going to preach to them unless there's an opening. I'm not going to, um, I'm going to figure out where they're at and be sensitive to each situation and if I value them and I love them, I, I want to look for those places to share, but again, not in a, not in a Bible-beating way. I mean, Bible-thumping just doesn't work for most people. It just doesn't. Like, we run from that. Um, yeah. What's been your experience? You've lived a little bit more life than I have. You've got, <laughs> got some wisdom. <laughs> a year or two. Yeah. I hope so. Um, I, I would say, you know, uh, just... Remember the second commandment from Jesus: "Love the neighbor as yourself." And and uh, if a person turn away from the Lord, don't treat them as a second class citizen. And you love them the same way, just like you love your your Muslim neighbor, for that matter. And you would, you know, what you would love the way that you would love your Muslim neighbor. You don't necessarily need to always convince them, but you love them. And if the same goes with uh, 
with the person who have turned away from the Lord, and sometimes we actually treat our even ex brothers and sisters tougher than you were to a newcomer. So I would I would just say just remember the second commandment. And I, I want to back up with that just for one second because there is there is a category that probably needs to be addressed. If someone is in the church claiming to follow Christ, but is violating some of the clear teachings of Jesus, there is a role for actually spirit, for, for church discipline. Uh, churches kind of pendulum swung on this. Old time churches really cracked down even to doing awful things, public shaming, whatever. Uh, well, you on the Reformation, Martin Luther killed the Anabaptists because he felt like they were too far. They, didn't, they took the Reformation farther than he wanted. Uh, yeah, we shouldn't be there. On the other hand, if someone is in the church and they're claiming to be a teaching elder, they're claiming to be in a position of authority, and they're clearly violating the basic clear things in the New Testament in their life, there is a time to say, you know what, we need to create some distance. If you're, if you're doing something that's harmful to others, there is, a, there is a role of sort of saying, okay, we need to create some healthy boundaries. We need to put boundaries up where they have been illegitimately taken down. Um, and, and that would be a whole other question, but just, just that caveat on that. So, oh, whoa, we just skipped. Oh, wait, go back to the other one. What is it? Oh, wait. Well, look at the time. It is time to be done. <laughs> it, it truly is time to be done. What do you believe about women leadership? Why did God come down to earth as a man and why not a woman? Because he had to make a choice and you're going to be one or the other. And if you're in cultures that are fallen and largely patriarchal, if you want your message to initially get out, you come down as a man. Um, It's interesting. Bible-believing Christians really debate this. And I'm not talking about progressive or liberal theological. That's a whole other thing. But people who are conservative on Scripture disagree on this question. Um, And I would say that... Uh, in general, we look at, you either look at the fall, and it kind of breaks down to this, how you interpret like the initial part of Genesis. You look at the fall as either it, either being part of patriarchy as a result of the fall uh, and, and male leadership or all of that, or you see that as being, no, and if male headship was before the fall, and the fall just turned it negative into sort of that domineering patriarchy sort of thing. Um, and so Christians disagree on the nature of the fall as it regards, to, regards gender roles, um, and then the other thing with Paul's writings, in some cases he's talking about women in leadership roles, and in other places he's saying women be silent, and how you interpret those texts. And Bible-believing Christians have debated those, and we do not have enough time to unpack all of those debates. Um, but I personally lean more towards egalitarianism, although I have served in churches that are complementarian, like the Christian Missionary Alliance in the U.S. generally is. Our church, the NAB church, generally is, although I, I think Baptists can be flaky on these issues because we're Baptists and we leave it to the local church, right? Um, I think the key with this one is don't put it in a primary position. It is not a creedal issue. It is not in the Nicene Creed. It is not in the Apostles' Creed. It is not in any of the apostolic proclamations that we read in Acts and in the the Acts and later in the New Testament. Um, I think we have to be careful that we can have strong, informed biblical opinions on this, but we, we need to also understand that Bible-believing Christians have not have legitimate, good biblical arguments with a variety of positions that, that result from this. So I'm going to give you that wishy-washy, lukewarm answer. And if you don't like that, I would love to meet with coffee with any of you, or of course David, or any of our elders, and, and really get into other ones that may not have come up today as well. Um, but we're going we're gonna to leave it at that. And uh, just do a teaser. Show us the next question. I'm not going to answer it, just so we know. Ten left. Wow, way to go. Well, take that one off the screen. I don't want to look at that one anymore. (laughs) Stand with us if you're able to do so. We're going to invite the worship team to come up, and we're going to end with a song to the Lord, as would be appropriate.